Chinese General Assembly, part of our continuing coverage. And speaking now, Spanish President Pedro Sanchez. And committed to an international rules based order, one based on the norms and principles enshrined in the United Nations Charter. A country, Spain, which believes in international accountability mechanisms. A country which fights against impunity, prompted to do so by our first hand experience and our history. We are a country that defends institutions such as the ICJ the I and the ICC, both crucial for the guarantee of peace, security, justice, and the reparation of victims. Ultimately, a country which, whose practice and conduct is guided by a crucial maxim, and that is the value of coherence. That maxim has compelled us to take the same stance on Ukraine, Gaza, and on any other place. We defend peace, human rights, and an international rules-based order. In the face of the doubters, we respond by placing greater trust in multilateralism. This very same multilateral system is one which the world built brick by brick on the ashes of barbarism is today withstanding great pressure, pressure which is dealing a heavy blow to three key ambitions for the progress of nations, peace, democracy, and development. These are three aspirations, peace, democracy, and development, which cannot be achieved in isolation. One cannot be achieved by, without the other two. Peace is incompatible with tyranny. Dem democracy needs to provide well-being and development in order to earn legitimacy for what it is, the most advanced form of social and political organization that man has ever created. Peace without democracy is the peace of jails, prisons. Democracy without development and progress is a precursor to autocracy, as clearly evidenced by a past rich in lessons that we must never forget. Consequently, working actively for peace, the first of these three aspirations, is today much more than a moral imperative. It is instead an existential need. For the first time, ladies and gentlemen, in two decades, the number of conflicts in the world is growing. The number of countries involved in wars outside of their borders is growing, rising to levels not seen since 1945. We're seeing an increase in the number of victims, the wounded, the maimed, and in the number of displaced persons. Also growing is the economic impact of violence. It today accounts for up to 13% of global GDP, according to some studies. That is, in other words, the equivalent of all the wealth created in one year by 180 countries combined. These figures are not only the expression of a major collective failure, as they do, but they are the symptom also of a global illness which is eating away at the foundations of a multilateral system and an international order based on principles and norms. These are principles which until just a short time ago seemed inviolable, the respect for sovereignty, political independence and the territorial integrity of countries. These principles are being eroded in Ukraine, as we gather in this hall, indeed. 31 months have elapsed since the beginning of a, an aggression which the Putin's Russia is waging not only against the Ukrainian people, but also against the whole of the international community. That is an aggression which cannot last even one day longer. The recent peace conference for Ukraine, held in Switzerland, laid the foundations for a just and lasting peace in line with international law and the United Nations Charter, as called for by the peace formula of President Zelensky. Consequently, I invite all countries who have not yet done so to join that initiative and to work on the next step, that is recovery and rebuilding in Ukraine. This year, Spain will increase its, its humanitarian aid and mine clearance funding to 14 million euros in 2025. Moreover, the Spanish Development Agency will establish a new work stream on recovery and reconstruction focused on food, water, and energy in Ukraine. 
The principles to which I referred are being eroded in Ukraine but also in Palestine. For almost a year now, we've been witnessing an unconscionable spiral of death and devastation, which is now unfortunately spreading to Lebanon. This is an escalation of the conflict which is woefully grave in nature. Consequently, Spain condemns in the strongest terms the death of innocent civilians once again. And consequently, I wish to once again call for de-escalation, detente and diplomacy. Diplomacy. International humanitarian law must be respected, as must international law. We must put an end to the conflict in Gaza and tackle the root causes of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That's the only way that we'll be able to successfully extinguish the hotbeds of tension that are jeopardizing regional and global stability. Everything we're seeing daily in Gaza and now unfortunately in Lebanon is forcing us to think about the very validity of international humanitarian law. Just as we mark the 75th anniversary of the Geneva Conventions, Spain will continue doing everything it can to provide humanitarian aid to the Gazan population with UNRWA as the key actor on the ground. However, None of this will be commensurate with need without a ceasefire. The only, th everything will be, everything except a ceasefire is insufficient. Once again, I appeal for a ceasefire, the release of hostages and the access of humanitarian aid. In any case, the evidence is resoundingly clear. We cannot go back to the, the the situation which previously prevailed. It is imperative and urgent to apply a two-state solution for Israel and Palestine to coexist side by side in peace and security. That is the only possible solution to a conflict which has already dragged on for decades and which has claimed so many innocent lives. Moreover, the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice requested, moreover, by this General Assembly of the United Nations has ruled that the occupation of Palestinian territories is illegal. What we're seeing is an occupation which must immediately stop. The time has come to work on the stabilization phase. That is the sole responsibility of the Palestinian Authority. Spain is committed to the PA and determined to increase that support. Ladies and gentlemen, as you will be well aware, Spain took the decision to recognize the state of Palestine on the 28th of May. That was a decision supported by the overwhelming majority of Spanish society and one whose only aim is to further the quest for peace in the region, a desire which has long been held. In 1949, a Spanish man, Pablo de Azcazate, was the first representative of the UN mediating mediator in Palestine. Today, it, re it continues to be moving to read his notes about that mission, which are full of bitterness in the face of the cat catastrophe that he senses was around the corner. Azcarate, Pablo Azcarate, was an a man in exile, a Spanish Republican that the dictator prevented from returning to his homeland. It is perhaps for that reason that he empathized so much with the suffering of that land. And his name deserves to ring out loud and clear 75 years since those uh, events. This year, before the end of this year, Spain and Palestine will hold the first intergovernmental me meeting to broaden and deepen our bilateral relationship. I also want to underscore the importance of the recent meeting in Madrid of the Euro-Arab Islamic Group to catalyze the peace processes and to allow the two-state solution to come to fruition. It is urgent that we convene the peace conferences with the parties and the international community. This is an initiative supported by more than 90 countries, and that is a peace conference which will allow us to revive the spirit of dialogue which prevailed in Madrid in the beginning of the 1990s when the Israelis and Palestinians sat around the same table to negotiate. At such a complex juncture, I wish to reaffirm Spain's unconditional support for and commitment to peace. 
demonstration of that commitment is the 670 Spanish troops deployed in UNIFIL under the command of a Spanish general. The work of peacekeeping missions is key in many arenas, such as in the Western Sahara. We will continue to support the special envoy of the United Secretary General to achieve a mutually acceptable solution which abides by law and which exists within the UN framework. But it's clear that beyond peacekeeping missions, we must tackle the underlying causes of conflict, as indicated by the new agenda for peace championed by the Secretary General. We resolutely support that agenda. With that in mind, the Indo-Pacific has become a center of gravity, and we must all contribute to maintaining peace in that region. We must all continue to demand the respect of basic principles of international law, such as the freedom of navigation at sea. Spain is willing to collaborate with to the work of partners to maintain stability and security. Ladies and gentlemen, while this turbulent landscape could cause us to lose heart, we can look at some projects such as the European project as, as an example of hope. No one would have imagined that in only a few decades we'd have seen such radical change in Europe's geopolitical landscape. Consequently, as part of the European Union, Spain is committed to that agenda for peace. In December 2020, Spain and the United Kingdom reached a bilateral agreement agreement on Gibraltar, uh, on something very important to Spain, that is Gibraltar, in the context of the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union. We continue to work flat out and have done since then, now with a new British government, so that that agreement lays can lay the foundations for a future relationship between that territory and the European Union. We have every faith that as soon as possible we'll be able to reach an agreement between or the EU and the UK will reach an agreement around Gibraltar. This agreement must be fully consistent with the UN doctrine on that territory. Of course, Spain fully aligns itself with that doctrine. Any agreement reached must be fully consistent with my country's legal position regarding the sovereignty and jurisdiction where Gibraltar is concerned. We must work to develop a prosperous a, a, a prosperous area of social and economic development which encompasses Gibraltar in its entirety, including the Campo de Gibraltar, together to th with the threats to peace, will, the world is facing a real risk of democracy being dismantled. And this brings me to the second aspiration that I want to touch upon. Rights that we thought acquired are today being called into question or undone. A reactionary global agenda is paving the way towards heated mistrust in institutions, polarization, and demands for the return of a, an invented past, as false as, as their proclamations. Democracy is waging a battle for its very survival. Let's be clear. We cannot give ground to our enemies. Democracy cannot. Democracy cannot hope to win this battle with its hands tied. Because let's be clear, we're facing un people who have no scruples. They are activists of lies. They are spreaders of fake news and hatred, and they're ready to tear societies in two to impose their regressive agenda. We must raise a shield to protect democratic institutions from those who deliberately seek to undermine them. We can no longer simply evoke the moral superiority of democracy. We need to correct mistakes work on internal rejuvenation of democracies and, of course, strengthen transparency and accountability of our democracies. We must also work to ensure that our citizens feel that democracy is close to them, something that belongs to them, that it is something alive, something living. With that in mind, Spain will champion that vision via our co-chairmanship of the Open Government Partnership that will hold its ninth global summit next year in Victoria Gastris. Against the backdrop to which I've referred, I think that the relationship between the EU and Latin America and the Caribbean becomes newly meaningful. These are two regions called upon to work together with a shared vision of the world. The situation, unfortunately, the unfortunate situation in Venezuela after the elections of the 28th of July is one of grave concern. I wish to once again reiterate Spain's unstinting commitment to democracy and the defense of human rights in that country. I wish to condemn any detention of or threat against political leaders. It is vital that the will of the Venezuelan people be respected. There must be a recount of votes in 
absolute transparency, this recount must be verified. I am convinced that we need more common arenas for dialogue. As such, Spain supports the holding of the next Ibero-American summit in November in Cuenca, in Ecuador, and we will host the Ibero-American summit in 2026. We will continue also to practice a feminist foreign policy. We'll do that to remain coherent and consistent with our past because, above all, to talk of feminism is to talk of human rights. Today, I wish to say loud and clear that the time has come. The time to act is now. Both the Secretary General and the Presidents of Presidency of this Assembly, when they, when new people are appointed to these posts, those people must finally be women. Spain supports and will firmly support the idea of men and women taking turns at the helm of this organization and will work to put an end to a situation which is quite simply unacceptable. For peace and democracy to prevail, it is vital, ladies and gentlemen, to heed the third aspiration that I want to talk about, and that is the sustainable development agenda. Democracy and peace gain legitimacy by their results. They gain legitimacy from their ability to provide well-being, to fight against inequalities in all their forms, and their ability to champion social justice, to promote the dignity of human beings. But it's not just a question of covering current material needs. It's also about doing that without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It's about safeguarding the future of our children, and it's about linking development and sustainability and seeing that as an existential need, not simply a moral imperative. I'm not going to issue a fatalistic speech about the climate emergency. We are all well aware of the impact on migratory flows and the price of the cost of not acting where climate action is concerned. But I'm not going to succumb to the melancholy of those that say that our battle is a lost one. I won't do that. Science is the answer. Science that puts the human being at the heart of our concerns and its concerns, and it's science that today reminds us that there's only one alternative. We need to elimit, eliminate fossil fuels. There needs to be more renewable energies and more energy efficiency. If we follow this guide, not only is there light at the end of the tunnel, there are major opportunities for development and substantive improvements to global competitiveness. I know all of this from my own experience. More than half of the electrical energy produced by Spain last year came from renewable sources. And at this point in this year, this volume is already surpassing 60%. There's much, much more behind these figures than cheap, clean and affordable energy for millions of homes. There's also better and more employment in emerging sectors and more opportunities for territories that hitherto haven't had industry. That's why it's so important to strengthen international development financing so that we can turn it into an authentic authentic lever for prosperity for countries in need. Spain is a country that knows that in order for its 48 million people to aspire to a, to a better future, we have to work so that the 8 billion inhabitants of our globe also have a dignified life and a better future. We have platforms on which we can, or within which we can take action to achieve wholesale reform of IFIs and within which we can update them. And this goes for multilateral development banks. But we need to go further. We need to move towards more just and more inclusive mechanisms. We need to tackle the debt problem, mobilize more sources of financing, and ultimately guarantee more help for those that need it most. We must implement more effective, transparent, and just tax policies, policies which champion the mobilization of domestic resources, including a minimum global tax on major fortunes and the full implementation of the two pillars of the OECD and G20 on the taxation of multinationalism, multinationals rather, as a basis for a future framework convention on tax cooperation. We will have an opportunity to make progress here at the fourth international conference on the finance on financing for development that we have the great honor of hosting in Seville in June 2025. Of course, you're all invited. This is a key event, uh, an opportunity to demonstrate that we're all able to update our multilateral system to ensure it can meet the challenges of the day. Seville will be a unique opportunity to expedite the achievement of the SDGs to which we are committed, that is fighting poverty, eradicating hunger, eradicating 
eradicating AIDS or ending gender discrimination, among many other challenges. It might be difficult to believe, but today we continue to hear insane speeches which criti criticize such noble ends and see ideological diktats in agendas where there's nothing other than common sense and humankind discourses speeches which criticize this hum this clearly humane agenda that is agenda 2030 and call it a concoction of global el global elites it's that is the craziness of our as of the craziness of our times we will be of a, a, a rational voice and will work to ensure that the FFD negotiating process is transparent and inclusive and that it brings about tangible results let today uh, we have uh, experience which shows us that reform is key. We've, we've reformed our cooperation for development system, and today I wish to say to you that we intend to increase our contribution to the UN development system to the tune of 25% between 2025-2027. As part of this vision, Africa is a key partner for Spain, and my belief is that it should also occupy its rightful place in the international community. That is key. We need Africa as a partner in addressing major challenges, but also there are no more excuses. The time has come to give the African continent the place it deserves. It's this spirit that has, uh, has driven forward our new strategy for Africa. What's at stake is not only strengthening bonds between countries in the region, but it's also about ensuring that our prosperity, security, and progress are closely linked to the prosperity, security, and inclusive progress of the African region. Humanity is facing many old challenges, such as those to which I've referred somewhat superficially. However, new challenges are emerging, such as those created by the expansion of AI. So often in the past, the emergence of disruptive progress creates fear and mistrust. And this isn't the first time this has happened. The discovery of writing, many said, would annihilate the acquisition of knowledge by memory. Many people said that the printing press would limit the, the depths to which, in which we could think. Even electricity was seen as a silent assassin of peace in the home. All new disruptions feel somewhat overwhelming. But what makes a difference is our ability to take a firm hold of the reins of progress. We need to combine progress with unimpeachable ethical rectitude, and that will be vital as we move forward. A few days ago, we learned of the seven key recommendations of the advisory body of the Secretary General for the global governance of AI. We must support these recommendations and continue with this joint effort to ensure that the decisions around AI do not remain in the hands of the few and to ensure that the development of AI is done ethically and responsibly for the benefit of all of humankind. There are always harbingers of doom, but data tells us that we know how to control progress. And I want to share some data with you, ladies and gentlemen. In just over a century, child mortality has reduced from 50 to 4% across the globe. The number of university students has doubled in only two decades. The percentage of women holding seats in parliament now stands at 27%. That is double what it was in 1990. The world has doubled its installed solar capacity in only four years. At the same time, energy produced by fossil fuels is drastically reducing. Let us not accept that the dawn of a new era of violence and wars is inevitable. The future is a relatively recent conquest for humankind. Being able to look forwards, get priorities in order, and think about a future is a privilege that modernity has given us. Let us therefore honor our responsibilities by looking ahead without fear and with hope. We let us choose to recast multilateralism in such a way as to leave us with a much better future than that which we currently stand to leave our children. Let us confront this tax with creativeness, audacity, with hope and ambition, the ambition that our age demands. Many thanks, ladies and gentlemen.